Yeah, so uh, thank you. So first, I would like to thank James for a very nice introduction. And uh, I would like to thank the conference organizers for inviting me here. So uh, I remember the first time I got to know DCO was in 2010 when there was a meeting in Beijing. So in fact, I was not attending that meeting, but uh, during the meetings, uh, Julia Gali interviewed me and later offered me a postdoc positions uh, related to, to DCO research. And a few years later, I think mostly because my postdoc research on the deep carbon science, and I got a faculty positions in Hong Kong. So honestly, uh, I cannot imagine without DCO what my career would be. So yeah, I'm really grateful to, the, to DCO. Okay, so today here I would like to mainly introduce some um, our recent uh, results and uh, their the, the simulations, but I would like to emphasize uh, the strong connections with the experiments. Okay, so here the, the question here we would like to answer is that, for example, if you dissolve carbon in water, what they are, for example, like uh, uh, at ambient conditions, uh, uh, in color uh, that uh, I had yesterday. And uh, most of, uh, made more than 99% of dissolved carbon is molecular CO2. But how about uh, at 10 gigapascal and 1,000 Kelvin as found in Earth's upper mantle? And this cartoon shows some complicated chemical reactions within only point uh, four to four picoseconds. So here, uh, the question here we would like to address is that what is the form of dissolved carbon under such extreme conditions? Is still molecular CO2 or bicarbonate or carbonate ions or other species? And uh, here for these studies, that uh, our study was motivated by this amazing work done by our uh, DCO collaborators, Professor Isabella Daniel and Professor Dmitry Sudzinski. And from this study, I learned that uh, uh, the, the, carbon, the aqueous carbon solutions are not simply mixtures of by uh, small molecules like CO2 or methane with water. So in fact, uh, the, this study suggests that the, uh, the, uh, the ionic interactions are very important. And also I have some feelings that uh, uh, for experimental studies, we may have some experimental data at very high pressure or a very high temperature, but it's very challenging to have experimental data at both high pressure and high temperature as found in deep earth. And this is what uh, our simulation can do. So here the simulation is called AB initial or first principle molecular dynamics. And uh, uh, the good thing for this method is that uh, it does not rely on empirical parameters or experimental inputs. So it's very good at uh, predicting. And basically, we combined the molecular dynamics simulations with uh, quantum mechanics calculations on the fly. And uh, so first, let's uh, see our uh, results. For example, for CO2 in water, and this work is mainly done by, our, by my uh, student, Laura, sitting here. And previously, we found that if we dissolve CO2 in water-rich solutions, uh, it's almost uh, gone, there is no CO2 here, and the majority is, uh, is bicarbonate ion. And later, uh, it was suggested by Professor Craig Manling, so what if we increase the concentration of carbon here? And uh, it should be a crossover, and after it, the CO2 will become dominating again because we don't have enough water to, rea to react with CO2. But the, here, the interesting thing is that Right above this crossover, uh, the carbonic acid, H2CO3, becomes the most abundant carbon species in solutions. So this is unexpected because uh, at ambient condition, for example, in my color, I can simply ignore it because the concentration for this species is so low. But here, we also tried multiple pressure and temperature conditions and work out this possible pressure and temperature range for this new carbon species indicating that it may be an important common carrier in deep carbon cycle. And uh, here, uh, we also compiled to, to some experimental results. Uh, after we publish our water-rich simulations, 
our DCL club uh, colleague, uh, Professor Abramson, also published some interesting uh, Raman studies on, the, uh, on CO2 uh, in water. And the, the, the interesting thing is that, as you can see, with increasing pressure, the CO2 signals uh, disappeared. And there is an unknown peak here at about uh, uh, 1,040 uh, wave number. And the, currently, we don't know whether it's high concentrations of uh, bicarbonate ion or carbonic acid. We are still working on it. OK, so here, my impression is that uh, in this kind of study, and also as shown by our previous speaker, the Raman spectroscopy is one of the very uh, powerful experimental tools. That is, uh, from, the spectra, from the peak position, you will know what they are. And from the peak intensity, you may know the concentration of species. If you know this coefficient, is called Raman scattering cross-section. And uh, for example here, if you would like to know some relative concentration, like more fraction or more percent, at least uh, you need to know this gamma ratio. The current situation is that at ambient conditions, uh, often we know this gamma ratio, but at extreme pressure and temperature conditions, uh, we know very little here. And this is, exact, this is exactly uh, what we can help. And because in our simulations, we know the concentration as shown in my cartoon. And here, if we can calculate the intensity, and then we can calculate this gamma ratio, and to use it to interpret our experimental findings. OK, so here the method is a dynamic method. So that is basically the Fourier transform of the polarizability autocorrelation functions. The good thing for this method is that it includes the temperature and harmonic effects, which are very important for supercritical fluids. And so, OK, so as an example here, this plot shows the calculated Raman spectrums for 0.9 molars sodium carbonate solutions at ambient conditions. And this topic uh, is from water. Maybe it's different from what you measured, because here uh, uh, we use heavy water to speed up calculations. It's a common trick in simulations. The interesting thing is that at around uh, 1,000 wave number, there are several peaks. And uh, we don't know whether there are signals or just a noise. So here, what we can do is that we can do the detailed peak assignments, for example, using vibrational density state. So here, for CO3 unit, there are four uh, normal modes. And for Raman study, so this one, called symmetric stretching, is the most important one. So yes, this is a signal. So here, what we can do is that, for example, if we would like to know the, uh, the gamma ratios uh, between the carbonate ion and the bicarbonate ion, so we can do two simulations, two solutions, and then uh, we use the water peak to align them to get this gamma ratio. So here, uh, the calculated uh, values for the uh, gamma ratios between carbonate and bicarbonate ions is 1.64, and the experiment value here is 1.46. They're close, but I have to say that our calculated values uh, uh, depends on the broadening here. So here, mostly we focus on how it changes with pressure and temperature. OK, so here uh, we tried uh, several uh, different pressure and the temperature conditions, and also the crystal calculations here. And then uh, the, the most important thing here is that we found these relations, basically this gamma ratio as a function of pressure and temperature. And we found that these gamma ratios decrease with increasing pressure, like this one, and uh, increase uh, with temperature. OK, so let's see what we have so far. And this gamma ratio between carbonate and bicarbonate ions is very important. And uh, almost, 20, uh, 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 almost 20 years ago, and uh, France, uh, using uh, some model calculations, uh, predict, uh, suggest that this gamma ratio should decrease uh, with increasing pressure. But more recently, Schmidt argues that, OK, this gamma ratio should not decrease. But how it changes, we don't know. So let's assume it does not change. We just use the ambient value. And in fact, our simulation suggests that, OK, this gamma ratio, in fact, increase uh, with increasing uh, temperature. So the direct consequence is that 
And when we analyze our Raman data, the concentration of bicarbonate ion may be underestimated here. Okay, so let's go back to see our uh, simulation results. And uh, uh, at, two, uh, at PB level and the PB zero level, and also the experimental values here is obtained by using the ambient gamma ratio. As you can see that indeed, the experimental value here is underestimated compared to the simulation here. This is consistent with our finding here. Okay, so okay, let me uh, summarize here. So the, there are two things here. First, we introduced some interesting uh, aqueous carbon reactions uh, at extreme conditions. And then the second part is that basically, we propose a first principle strategies uh, to get uh, the speciations in solutions by, uh, with uh, Raman spectroscopy. So by, uh, basically so by calculating the ratios of Raman scattering cross sections. And this method in principle is not only for carbon species and also for any other uh, aqueous species also should work. Okay. Uh, at the end of my talk, I would like to thank our funding providers, so particularly uh, DCO, and also uh, the Croucher Foundation is in Hong Kong. It's a private foundation for science and technology. So in my opinion, it's very similar to uh, Sloan Foundation. So I can continue my deep carbon science research in the next few years. And here I would like to thank my former uh, advisors, Julia Gali, and uh, my DCO collaborators all around the world. And the last uh, but not least, I would like to thank uh, the DCO clusters maintained by Professor Peter Fox as a volunteer. Uh, yesterday he told me that uh, uh, we will continue around these clusters in the future. So for me, because it's, a, it's an electronic device, so for me it sounds like a miracle, really. So let me ask you, like, uh, where is your iPhone bought seven years ago? So our cluster bought seven years ago is still working. So it, it's, <laughs> if every electronic device is like this, then the Apple company will go bankrupt easily. <laughs> okay, so yeah, thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ding. Wonderful talk. Do we have any questions? Do not hesitate. We have a minute. Um, I can't see. Yeah, okay. Uh, who is it, Mark? No, I can't see Mark. Uh, thanks, Dan. I really enjoyed your talk. I was interested oh, in um, your kind of overprediction of the Raman cross-section. I was wondering if you could speculate on whether quantum nuclear vibrational effects would be important since the vib you know, this, this, you could almost treat these molecules as, as mostly harmonic. So oh, okay. So the question is that uh, whether the harmonic effect are important here? Uh, quantum nuclear vibrational effects. Oh, quantum uh, nuclear effects here would be important. Oh, yeah, this is a very good question. So in principle here is that in our simulations, we treat uh, the nuclei as a classical particle here. So in principle, everything should be quantum. But here that uh, our temperature conditions, uh, our temperature is very high, so we can estimate that uh, the quantum effect may be not as important as ambient or low temperature conditions. Yeah, indeed, there are some comparisons at ambient conditions. I think here that uh, um, there are some shifts in the vibration modes, but uh, here for the intensity, I would not uh, think that, uh, I would not uh, expect that uh, there is a very big effect here. Yeah, I, I agree. It, um, I was wondering if you made any simple comparisons to test that, like you could uh, see if at higher temperatures your data better matches lower temperature experimental data, so approximating quantum effects by increasing the temperature of the system. Yeah, this is a very good question here. Like, uh, what we, uh, we did is that we tried to compare the results uh, to some experimental results. Indeed, we find that uh, the agreement is better at high temperature than it, uh, at uh, low temperatures. But here, uh, honestly, for this kind of spectroscopy calculations, if you really want to do the full quantum calculations, it's very, very expensive here, but uh, uh, maybe we can do something like uh, coupled with some force field calculation, we can estimate it. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you. Well, let's thank, oh, do you have a question? No, let's thank them again. Thank you. Thank you.